We're already eight minutes in retardo. So, our next thesis takes us to Baltimore. Uh, takes us to another important piece of infrastructure, Penn Station. Um, a lot of history behind this place. Um, and uh, we have uh, Sarah Ali that's going to um, tell us that, about the fact that right now we stand at an important point in history. A, if you will, a critical juncture where we can make some decisions that propel us in a very positive urban direction where we can retreat from that. And uh, Sarah's committee is comprised of Jamie Tillman over here, the chair, uh, Steve Hurt in the back, uh, in the middle ground, Margaret McFarlane, and myself. And I will say that uh, Sarah is one of our dual degree candidates, uh, Master of Architecture uh, and Master of Real Estate Development. So, it's all yours. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a guest, too. Yes, we have a guest. Where do you go? Okay. Terrence Howard from Amtrak. Hancock. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Terrence Hancock from, from Amtrak. So, when we get into the weeds, we can, we can tap him. Go ahead, sir. First, I'd like to start off with my gratitude, um, an appreciation of endless inspiration, my parents, endless motivation, my four children, <laughs> determination um, from my husband, um, direction from my committee, uh, Brian Kelly and James Tillman, and to all of my professors, students, um, classmates, and all of you friends for your collaboration. I appreciate all of it. Um, and we wouldn't be here with all, all of you. It's really a team effort. So, make no little plans. They have not the means to stir men's blood, wrote Daniel Burnham in 1909. Years later, we heard, we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. <laughs> these words were spoken by John F. Kennedy. And they were about massive projects that were inspirational to a nation and really to the world. We now stand at a critical juncture where the rest of the world is connecting with major infrastructure projects and high-speed rail. We in the United States are crumbling under our own infrastructure. This thesis seeks to examine what happens when a purposeful intervention is made at Baltimore's Penn Station, one that accommodates the future maglev rail as part of the Northeast Corridor. A fully integrated and augmented mass transit system can make Penn Station an important economic node in the city and in the greater Baltimore region. The station expansion and design of the surrounding plazas can revitalize Penn Station so that it could become a destination unto itself. <laughs> Nations are made up of mega regions. Mega regions are usually defined by a network of metro large metropolitan regions that have similar environmental qualities and topography, economic connections, and infrastructural systems. The Northeast mega region comprises only 2% of the land area of the United States, however, is responsible for producing 20% of our GDP. It holds 17% of the population, and that population is expected to grow by 35% by 2050. As we all know and are well familiar, the highways massively congested around each one of these cities along the Northeast Corridor. Airports in the Northeast are taken, are uh, congested by short trip flights of under 500 miles an hour 
I'm sorry, under 500 miles. And this congests the airspace for um, international and transnational flights. Of course, we're looking again at a congestion map of the rail network, but I'd like to point your attention here to the Northeast Corridor, which is the busiest corridor in the United States for rail. It's also indicative of really what has become the spine of our Northeast region. High-speed rail is something that we hear a lot about. We have what we call high-speed rail in the U.S. And I should just mention that high-speed rail is still the existing technology of steel-on-steel -steel infrastructure. Okay, so um, in Europe and Asia, the tracks have been made straighter. They do not share the tracks with um, freight trains. Therefore, they can go, the trains are, can go faster. We can see in this comparative maps of Europe, Eastern Asia, and the United States, we're looking at rail lines that are comprised of um, some, it's a little hard to see, but a few rail lines here in Europe that can reach over 200 miles per hour, one here in Japan, over 200 miles per hour, a proposed rail in the US. Um, but really, we're looking at an inadequacy on our own part. We have one little 125 mile per hour segment right there in the US compared to continents. And this brings us to the magnetic levitated trains. This is a new technology. This technology uses superconducting magnets to literally levitate the train off the track. These Trains have been tested in Japan at over 375 miles per hour, and there is currently construction underway in, uh, from Tokyo to Nagoya. China also has proposed maglev trains, not just for their long trips, but for actual regional um, transit. Here's a diagram of how maglev actually works. So by um, using the powerful electromagnetic um, pulses, um, it, the opposite polarity actually levitates the train off the track. At the same time, by using alternating current, the train is literally pushed and propelled at the same time by this magnetic pole. And without any moving parts, there's very little, fr there's no friction except for airflow. Um, and there's only rubber wheels that actually extend down at the platform to just hold the train in place. And once it reaches up to speed, they lift up. All right, so it, all is not lost. <laughs> there is a current proposal for a maglev in the Baltimore, Washington region. Now, it's kind of a test track. It's an initial proposal it's by a private company, probably not the best thing for a national infrastructure project. However, it'd be great if we could get this going. So this is a project that is um, currently in its development phases and has been given some grants. This is what the world could look like. We don't look at it like this very often, do we? But imagine the world being connected by maglev. Um, it's the literal land bridge. What happens when we have maglev here in the US and specifically in Baltimore? Currently, we go from Baltimore to New York in just under three hours on our current train system. If we were to upgrade to high-speed rail, uh, a la Europe, um, and the TGV, we could reach New York in under two hours. Maglev, we can reach DC in 15 minutes. We can reach New York in 45 minutes, and Boston in just over two hours. Who's in for maglev? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, great. We're all going to get on the maglev train. We need to get on the train. This requires a station. I had, did have the opportunity to go visit a couple of stations in Europe over um, the winter break. And, um, of course, have looked at the um, old Penn Station in New York City. But they're monumental buildings. And the thing that, about the train station is that um, 
you can really see what's happening. There's, there's an openness to the station, and you always kind of have a, a place to um, understand where the trains are and how you get to the train. But train station isn't enough. We need to think bigger. So right now we are talking about, it's very popular, the transit-oriented development, right? It's a popular phrase. We're talking about a five to 10 minute walking time when we're talking about transit-oriented development. That's the radius. We need to start thinking on this level for each train station that we want to build. This is a station area regeneration, and this encompasses a one hour transit time to the station. So imagine the more efficient that your mass transit is, the larger the influence of your station area. So this is when the integration of all of the infrastructure comes into play. You need to really think about these four elements in the star region. You need to have a regional vision of transit. You need to encourage centrality, not in one location, but in many nodes. You need to increase the connectivity to the station. And you need to have development incentives directly around the station area. Another piece of good news, directly around Baltimore's Penn Station, there have been just under $400 million of the projects completed within the last five years. There's another $200 million project worth of dollars of projects that are underway. And this is old. There's probably more. There's even a um, development proposal right now on the actual site that I have. So this is sure to grow. Looking directly at the community surrounding the station, it's flanked by the University of Baltimore just to the south. Um, and also um, MICA, a little bit further to the east. Um, the station arts and entertainment district directly to the north of the station. And then we have the cultural landmarks of the Opera House and um, the Symphony Hall. So look a little bit at um, Penn, Penn Station itself. I mean, you're going to see this image a lot. It's very indicative of how the station sits in the city. Um, but I'd like to talk about why it sits there and its configuration within the city grid. Baltimore is the grandfather of the entire national rail network. So it is, um, it, the B&O Railroad was built um, to replace the canals um, of, that were bringing goods um, from the interior of the country to the coast. So um, the Baltimore Harbor is unique because it's the most inland harbor, um, therefore, and it's a deep water harbor, so a lot of ships would, go, would come there. So we needed to get from the harbor up to the um, Piedmont region and then into the interior of the nation. So where the rails were placed, you can see that Baltimore, um, where the Penn Station is in um, relation to the historic sites of Baltimore, it's directly on this north-south corridor. Um, and this was a major thoroughfare um, at the time um, there. So, and here's where it is now. So we, everybody's familiar pretty much with the Inner Harbor, and that's almost where the central business district has migrated to. Um, Penn Station sits just under two miles away from the Inner Harbor. Um, so right now it's a little bit removed from the activity of the city. But we're going to fix that. All right. So now we understand how the station sits in the city, and let's understand how it actually sits in the topography. In order to get those rails that the B&O was making up to the Piedmont region, they had to use a gentle slope. It was a new tech job. It was a new technology. So they just chose to use the Jones Falls River rail bed. It's a very gentle slope. So they literally placed the tracks in the rail bed and they diverted the river. It's a rather small river. It's not a big deal. Uh, <laughs> all right. So then you overlay the street grid on top of that. So you now see that you have a configuration where the station and the street grid 
are on two angles. So you have the orthogonal angle of the street grid and approximately a 30 degree angle um, of the station itself. And that's when you can see this happening here. With the river down below, it's been diverted in concrete. It used to have industrial coal tracks that were transporting up the river to the mills and such. And then you have the rail tracks behind, which still remain. 1950s era, we introduced the highway, and now the river is underneath of the highway, and the station is now an island between highway and railroad tracks. It's also tenuously connected from the east and west to North Charles Street and St. Paul Street. Here's a simple um, site section, just kind of diagramming how all of these components fit together and where Penn Station sits in the fabric, as well as the difference between the northern part of the city with residential scale buildings, and that's the University of Baltimore John Angelos Law Center um, at, that, at the larger city scale. This is the existing site plan. Again, notice where the rail tracks are, the highway, the residential neighborhood, and the city scale. I'm going to now turn all of my plans so that north is going to be facing to the right, and that's how it's oriented on all of these boards. And this is where um, I introduced the first design decision. Uh, I decided to actually deck over and literally connect the um, station itself back into the urban fabric. And that means that the highway is now going underneath of. The next thing I did was to look at the um, grid or regulating lines that the station itself creates by its angle in relation to the city. And I followed that through, showing the existing rail lines there. On the northern end of the site, you can see the orthogonal grid making its way and marching down towards um, the city uh, district. And this is where the maglev rail has been aligned underground. When you put these two grids together, you can see a literal shift that happens in this area. This right triangle is where the maglev is placed. It's going to be the orientating feature of the entire station. You can look down and see that maglev from stories above. Here's the new site plan, showing them, again, the void where the maglev can be seen. And then the buildings outlined in orange would be some high density development. We need to pay for that decking somewhere. Um, and then a new street that I'm connecting in from an existing Oliver Street over to St. Paul Street, allowing um, that block to flow through and I'm still maintaining the connection and drop-off point in the front of the existing Penn Station. Okay. So now I'd like to walk you through how we work through this station. All right, so this is the site plan we just looked at. So let's say you'd like to go to DC. You're not in a particular rush. So you can enter through the front of Penn Station, you can enter actually through the old station building itself or through the wings that are open here to the side on top of the new train shed, essentially. You can come through and then you have vertical circulation that allows you to come down to the platforms below. If you're in a rush and you have a 10 a.m. meeting in New York, you need to be dropped off on the north end of the site so you can get to the maglev right away get to New York in 45 minutes, have your hour meeting, come back home, you're home by one, time for lunch, great. Um, so, um, this, is the, this would be the north drop-off point, come down, here's the maglev waiting area, security zone, and literal uh, vertical circulation underground. You can see here, this, I'm gonna move to the side here a little bit, okay. So you can see here, that this level comes in from the street at the back and stretches all the way across, allowing some 
permutate um, some holes through so we can see down and understand where we are in the station at all time. This becomes the orientating feature in the station. In addition, I've proposed a possible new subway line. This does not exist in Baltimore, but absolutely should. So you can connect back into the city grid and the city transit system and expand our star area. Let's see. I'd like to show you a couple, a little bit more about this. So you can see here the regional platform plan where there's a secure area. This is the void above. So each platform um, has its own um, escalator and elevator getting down to it. Again, you can still see the maglev um, below and where it would exist. And we're looking here in this view. This would be the platform view here, where you can see this maglev void um, from the station. This would be a um, representation of what it might look like to actually be in the, in the void itself and getting ready to get onto the maglev train. And you can see the massive structure and stories above you. So, the people I spoke about in the beginning of this presentation were inspirational. Daniel Burnham designed a city um, and for, will forever be known for that. John F. Kennedy got us to the moon. It's in this spirit that I designed this project and really went for a, the big dream. And I think it's something that we can all benefit from and we really should see more of in the future. With that, I'd like to open up the floor for a lively discussion and um, thank you for your time. It's actually something that I hadn't, I had never ridden a regional train until this past year oh, in the wow. U.S. Yeah. And it's, it's it, very convenient. You, you see it, you can read. Uh, it's must, work. it is, I, it's much less stressful than the airport and of course driving. It and takes you to the city. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I want to know. Why Baltimore? Why did you choose Baltimore? Okay, so I am from Baltimore, so that's one, and I have an affinity for the city. And um, I really think that a project on this scale is what a city like Baltimore needs. It's really been, not that it's altogether bad, it's become kind of a knowledge center city, um, but that leaves a large part of the population out for right now it was an industrial city that's how it was built and I believe a project like this um, could really reinvigorate that idea of manufacturing technology and just reawaken 
what the city was built on to begin with. So, and besides, it's a nice station. <laughs> Yes. The, those uh, buildings that you have uh, underlining orange color, mm -hmm. are those uh, proposed by you? Yes. So it's kind of reestablishing the urban fabric that's sort of lost in that area. Yes. So it's been slowly creeping um, northward. Right. Um, and, and I think University of Baltimore is one that has put this um, forward thinking building. So the, what they represent is your intention to densify that block so that uh, your building can operate better as an urban piece. Yes. And this diagonal sort of curvy uh, drop off, no, in front of the, so mm -hmm. you started that one right there. Yes. Is that proposed too, right? So it's, uh, yes, that's proposed. It's partially existing, but I'm rerouting the entry. Right now, the, currently the entry is um, directly off of St. Paul. Yeah. And it sort of continues onto a, a, a highway ramp. Yes. Right. It is. Okay. Well, th there's okay. there's still some issues. You know, I'm pretty sure uh, you're aware of uh, designing highways and streets, which is not our field of expertise. Yes, I will be talking to my consultants about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 it seems to me you will be needing a couple of uh, stoplights. And this one here seems like way too close to such an important three-lane avenue, or whatever. But that's that's not significant. I also want to commend you on on on, on your work, on your the, the thoroughness of your research and investigation, and how well uh, put together your explanation is. It's definitely a relevant uh, project, a, a relevant problem that architecture needs to address. It's an architectural issue, and you're proposing an architectural uh, solution, which is very pertinent. It's not it's not a simple project. It's complex in many levels. You know, geometrically, it's like a nightmare of a site. You know, it's, it's layers and layers. That you you got the geometry. You got the issues with the urban fabric. You got the circulations of, of people, vehicles, trains, subways. You, you name it. You know, quite difficult. Besides, you have a historic building, and now you're adding to it with contemporary pieces, and you know that all, all by itself is a big question right there. I mean, it's, it's a, this is definitely uh, a complex project to tackle, which is at the level of a uh, uh, master's uh, thesis, of course, right? Uh, I think your overall uh, siting proposal is is probably well intended, and. Uh, it might work, but uh, to be honest, I find that it might, at this point, remain somewhat schematic. You know, as I see it on that drawing, which correlates with all the others. You know, I see that you recognize the historic building running through the diagonal, and then you are adding on this uh, great concourse in, in glass that sort of attaches to it, but still starts uh, trying to fix or, or or negotiate between the diagonal direction of the building and the remaining grid of the city and then you're going making this perimeter uh, structure that sort of uh, will help to reestablish the, the public space of the street much needed and then you're having that park on that corner they are all good ideas you know but the way they connect into each other at this point seem like they're sort of just juxtaposed like sitting next to each other and you know the, the connections both in plan and in massing I'm, I'm afraid that that can benefit from, from some more, uh, some, yeah, consideration on your part. Uh, also, you know, it's a matter of uh, the program of the train station. You know, there are things that I don't get to see immediately, but it's not hard to solve. Like, for instance, uh, ticketing or restrooms or mechanical facilities or I see retail and stuff. But there's there's a lot to it. Like, where, where do you leave your bags and all that? There's ample room to solve it, you know. No problem. It's not like it's not like I don't see how to tackle that, but it's still just suggested, and uh, uh, it would be good to have some more of, uh, of that into your drawings. Agreed. Um, I would 
would like to see these two drawings up here, like Penn Station, 1915, 2017, and uh, what's your, you know, a third way to complete that set, which would show what this project would look like in that context, because for me it's still a little difficult to tell, and with the, you know, like um, um, Juan was saying, the uh, geometrical uh, gymnastics that are going on in your plan, I wonder what they look like three-dimensionally. And um, this new um, glass um, um, uh, building, the building. There's what? What is there now? Nothing. Nothing. So what's the, what's that building? What's that for? So this is um, houses where the maglev rail will be underground. No, I'm talking about this. This, this hall, one. Oh, the the vaulted vault gallery. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Really, in order to connect the station in, you need to really extend the floor from the existing station over to the opposite side. And this puts the regional rails underneath. It's like the concourse, right? It is the concourse, exactly. Um, and so this is in um, respect to really the train shed. And I, I tested many different varieties of what this roof system would look like. And, um, and essentially, it, the, reg the barrel vault just kind of made the most sense. Um, it is large, but it's a <laughs> it's a large span. Um, it's something that um, I always kind of fought with to to get it to work at this um, angle, right? Because it's not just a regular barrel vault. You end up with this. Yeah, well, maybe it should have been an angle. Maybe it should have been a continuation of the of the um, existing structure of the station. Maybe it should have been smaller because I think right, you know, this growing up here particularly dwarfs the station, and I think the station is probably the elements you most want to express, even though you want you don't want to make any any uh, small plans. <laughs> Maybe the um, train ship might have been a small plan. So I think that um, it's a little bit. I, I agree with you as far as the scale of the new station and the old station, and that was a decision that I made because. It's a maglev. You want it to be a beacon in the city, right? While this station is a lovely station, it is tiny in comparison to the other stations. Um, even um, Union Station in um, DC is about 10 times the size of this station. Um, and the way it sits, because it's sitting literally in a riverbed, in the river valley, it's really sunken down into the city and it almost feels like you're kind of headed down to the station. So by making it larger, I was making the decision to actually make it a prominent feature in the city rather than kind of getting lost in that river valley. I understand, but I think that, you know, I think you have to make a decision as to the architectural quality of the existing station. And, you know, admittedly, in these two photo these two photographs up here, it's not it's not very grand, but um, maybe it could be, or maybe it should be. I don't, I'm not familiar with the station, but um, if it were me, I would put more emphasis on the existing station, clean that thing up, and make and, and your appendages for the uh, the train and all that. I would, I would downplay those and make, make them glass like you're doing, but I think it could make it less less an intrusion on the, uh, the uh, overall fabric. City. Okay. Um, first of all, I appreciate a lot of this topic. It's amazing. I'm so happy that uh, on Friday I will be there in that station. <laughs> <laughs> so I passed there. Okay. And, now you can uh, imagine. And, uh, in Italy, it's a very controversial uh, issue. No? We have the high speed train, uh, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. the, you <laughs> travel around to Florence, but uh, so I really enjoy for this uh, next step, not the future. So you have an uh, amazing topic to develop. Uh, but at the same time, you have a lot of topic in an architecture scale because you don't have just the train station, but you have also the piazza in front, uh, the station. You have another block on the left, uh, another back solution for the right uh, section, and. Um, I agree with what you said before. I think uh, the, the, uh, in terms of architecture scale, uh, what is very important is to understand how your new building 
will be impact with the context. And uh, so my suggestion in general, uh, we appreciate the existing site plan and the new site plan where actually we can make a comparison between the, your intervention and the context. Um, we cannot check the same relationship either in terms of elevation or section. Maybe urban section, urban elevation make a more relation with the urban context as well. Uh, Sarah, uh, I'd love to go to your train station, <laughs> and uh, while I'm there, I just wondered if you had considered uh, adding more program to the concourse. It's such a spectacular space. It makes me think of Calatrava's Oculus in New York, and. Uh, the Oculus is really activated and enlivened with a lot of retail, and it connects to the mall that has all kinds of wonderful food in it, so that when people are coming home or departing, you know, there are ample opportunities to, uh, you know, browse and buy things and so forth. So, you know, since you're also a real estate development student, I wondered if you had considered um, you know, filling up some of that gorgeous light-filled space with uh, some commercial opportunities. So. Oh, yes, of course I did. Um, really, what I what I discovered in this process is um, the excitement that I had for kind of thinking about train stations and what they do in the urban fabric. Um, I I really honestly under underestimated the scale and the importance of connections, just thinking about the transit connections. How do you get people through one station and one mode of transit, and possibly to another mode of transit, and vice versa, so going in the opposite direction, and then also connecting in the east and west sides of the block, um, through the Galleria. So wrestling with all of these um, things and, and the geometry really ended up being um, the bulk of the project. And yes, of course, there's a massive, massive space here that could be filled with um, temporary installations, permanent installations, all kinds of things that you could imagine. And it just ended up not becoming part of the scope of this project at this time. That was just what happened. But you could tell the audience you did do a real I estate. I did do a real estate. <laughs> so, while, <laughs> that's right, well, so while I took on the, while I took on the massive train station for my thesis for real estate development, I actually proposed a boutique hotel inside of the old train station, which, by the way, these three floors are currently abandoned and vacant. Um, and Mr. Hancock was kind enough to invite me on a tour of these floors. And to be honest, one of the best rooms, which is a small photograph here, was the existing control room from the original station. And um, it still has the steel panels of the maps of all of the rail lines. Um, and you can see kind of on a similar scale, the background graphics of my boards are taken from this, but it is um, on, that, on that massive scale. So yes, I, I, while I did the largest, or one of the largest projects, in thesis, I did one of the smallest projects in real estate development, but still a successful one. <laughs> that the old station is not up to date and uh, even if you renovate it, it's really not enough so you are getting something new and you are using the old station for a hotel or something else that will serve the, the new station. Uh, I, I like to hear from the emperor guest. Okay. Uh, <laughs> on the spot. Um. So good morning, everyone. I'm uh, again. <laughs> good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Terrence Hancock. I'm a senior real estate manager with Amtrak. Um, this project is very timely, as we have an RP out on the street 
for redevelopment of the station and several Amtrak owned properties that surround the station, including some of the uh, the rail yards and the what we call the Land of Street uh, lot, which is the parking lot behind or north of the station. Sarah does point that out. So, so I, I'm very impressed uh, with the amount of work that was uh, put into this presentation. I um, met Sarah about two months ago, and um, I had just started at Amtrak um, in February, so I needed a tour of the station myself. As this is one of my uh, projects that I'm working on, and so I invited, and then Sarah called my boss, and then we got into a tour, and so I got to see the, the same uh, upper floors, as we call it, that, that Sarah did, and um, I have a lot of work to do, to, to say the <laughs> least. Um, so I'm, this is, this project is very timely. Um, as I said before, we have an RP out on the street, and the proposals are due shortly. So I'm interested to compare Sarah's uh, project to uh, the quote unquote real life project that I'll be evaluating uh, soon. Um, I won't uh, uh, comment on the magnet technology because that's a competing technology with, with the Amtrak. So, um, <laughs> but the the uh, the premise is still there. Uh, we need higher speed rail, uh, regardless of what technology it is, whether it's still steel, steel rails, or or, or, or maglev, or some other um, type of higher speed rail um, to really um, keep generating um, economic development uh, throughout the Northeast Corridor and then perhaps California and the rest of the country. So um, I'm very impressed and, uh, um, and hope to see if any of these elements uh, come through um, in, a, in a real life uh, presentation. So thank you. Let's be clear, Amtrak could take on that love. <laughs> so nice, nice job, Sarah, Thank on you. the um, project and the research. Very compelling case for this type of infrastructure in, in um, the buildings and the architecture and the planning that would support it. I have one, one question and, and one comment. When you um, were leading us through the, the kind of the wayfinding of, of how you would arrive at the station, um, you mentioned that the regional uh, riders would arrive through the south, old building and the um, maglev through the north, but the maglev riders could arrive from the south also. Absolutely. And so that's just, um, I'm just wondering about how that presented and if you want to think about the existing building as it is right now, kind of a front door facing south to the city and organize the wayfind, the primary wayfinding with that in mind. You know, take me to the train station, everyone knows where to go, how to go. And, and then even the kind of the, um, whether you're getting there on a bike, on foot, taxi, Uber, you know, um, that it has kind of a front door. Um, the, the second question is more kind of related back to some of the things we explored in, in the Architecture 600 studio and the, um, the, the Galleria uh, component of your project, just considering a, a bit how it both um, has kind of a new structure and face to the, on its north side and it, how it connects to the existing building to the south and what that interface is, because they are different conditions. There is a sidedness to it. Um, and then it, it looks like most of it's glass, both the roof and the top. And But although in, in the perspective down there, it looks like there's some consideration for how you modulate light. Um, and so I think those are things that you want to take into consideration as well. Absolutely. Nice, nice job. Thank you very much. Sarah's a, a 
sort of hang around member of your committee. Um, I want to comment, Billy, on, on, on two things. The first one, uh, on the previous presentation, Brian Kelly talked about the, the um, difficulty of uh, going through lots of iterations, you know, to get to something that you're finally satisfied with. And having seen this project a couple of weeks ago and uh, laid on some pretty heavy criticism about where the, uh, about both the specific organization um, and the extent to which you could reveal the connections um, from one level to another, and also uh, pretty heavy criticism on the, on the glass piece uh, behind it. You have done an absolutely stunning job of uh, rethinking that, that set of relationships in a relatively short period of time um, and make it a very nice presentation uh, out of that. So my compliments. I mean, it's, uh, that, that, that is just stunning progress that you made in a very short period of time. It's really marvelous. Um, uh, that, that said, it's, it's, uh, I, I want to offer a critique um, yes. also. Um, not so much focused on the building because the, 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 the building has really been the focus of this project, much, much less so uh, this whole you know, area that you felt obligated to uh, show us right here at the, at, at the end. And what that does is draw my attention to the, to the simple idea, really, that uh, people coming to this station would, would likely be getting dropped off in all kind of different places all around the station, just on a convenient basis, particularly since North Charles and, and St. Paul are one-way pairs and likely remain that way for some time. What, what, what struck me also, when listening to the, the comment about, you know, the, the difficulty that you struggled with with the rotation and the angle of the station relative to the grid and how to resolve that, which, which does a pretty nice job architecturally, it, it struck me it extends to this whole urban block, you know, kind of situation. And it's, it's very obvious that you look pretty carefully at the idea of framing an axis, you know, through here. That could be stronger in the plan, simply. Um, but it also struck me that the, the kind of diagonal situation that people crossing at the corner uh, and moving through and how that extends and how that might actually operate in much the same way that you were trying to deal with it in the structure, you might also deal with it in this multi-block plan as well. Yeah. OK. Um, so Sarah. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to work with you this semester. Uh, your optimism, your attitude, um, your belief in making no small plans is inspirational. Um, but I just go back to the, uh, the beginning of the semester and the posters uh, when you all present your thesis projects to the faculty. And, and so my antennae were immediately um, kind of, kind of uh, tickled by these pictures of technology, and I thought, oh, technology. This this could be an interesting, interesting thing. And um, as the semester has has gone on, the technological aspect of this has remained front and center. And um, in the United States, uh, we may an incredible investment in our aviation technology, uh, not only manufacturing, um, but our, our airport and aviation infrastructure. And for some reason, um, the, the rail infrastructure has lagged behind, and I'm reminded just on a personal note that the last presentation I gave in China uh, for a project, the PowerPoint was put together in the, in the first cabin of a high-speed rail car. Um, and it just so happened it took us four hours to go from point A to point B. And it was perfect. It was a seamless experience. And so one of the themes here that I think is very important to, to sort of appreciate is that rail travel is linear by definition. It involves an appreciation of places that are associated with each city, which is not a part of the aviation experience. And that's why it's so terribly important that the architectural solution have a prominent place um, 
in the identity and the image of the city. And I very much appreciate the boldness uh, that has emerged in this. Um, being rather fond of triangles myself, this as the clarion call of a new technology, I really appreciate that move. Um, and the contrast with the, with the barrel vault. Um, the idea that something new technologically is there, latent, right, ready for us to experience is, is a terrific idea. So just in closing, um, I think the dialogue about what kind of program um, would begin to emerge from this exercise is, is obviously the next piece. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm very happy that we got there with that question because at the base of this, this is, this is a transformational uh, project. And in the very best tradition of thesis projects, it brings us to the threshold of other great questions about the implication of this technology and how it can be transformative in our lives. So I want to congratulate you on a terrific semester and on thinking big, and I wish you all the best in carrying this forward. So, congratulations. Okay, folks, we're going to